I see something that says live on Facebook on my end. Is it? Okay. There we are. Hello, everybody. And we are just getting started here. Give us a minute and we'll just get started. Yeah. There we go. Now we're up live. So let's see how we've got somebody's here. Hey, Leslie's here. Not sure well my sound's coming through on both <laughs> that's interesting sounds off on the phone but it's not off on the phone there we go yeah i can hear it too all right we'll give it a minute just to see who else is here hey denise is here debbie's here yay hey debbie okay so I'm going to have to just turn that phone and close that phone down. Anyhow, thank you all for coming. I'm sure hopefully others will join us as we go along. And welcome to interview number two for Humanity Needs the Horses. And uh, we have another interview from the field. And this time we're coming from the south of me here. So I'm coming uh, to you from Toronto, Canada. And if for those that don't know me, my name is Linda Watson and I am the founder and publisher of Equine Leadership Magazine. And I have set up my house so we have past issue front covers in behind us. And, and here is what this year is going to look like once we get uh once we get it published and printed or once we get it printed but uh, that's gonna have to wait for a little while so thank you for coming for interview number two and i would like to introduce you to kim hallen but she's coming to us from the states today on a beautiful day as i hear yesterday was not so beautiful so we are being blessed uh thanks for joining kim thanks for uh joining us here yeah thanks linda i'm so excited i Absolutely. really really feel honored to be here Awesome. Well, we are honored to have you. And Kim wrote an article in our last issue, in issue number five, and uh, hopefully we will touch on that today as well. So, Kim, why don't we start with just you introducing yourselves. Tell us a bit about your farm and the land you're on. We'll get into the work you do in a bit, but just, um, yeah, what, uh, what do you got there? All right. Well, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Kim Hallen, as Linda said, and uh, here on my farm, uh, which is just a three acre farm, so small probably compared to a lot of the farms you're going to visit through this series. Um, I'm located just outside of Charleston, South Carolina in the United States, and I've lived on this farm for um, almost 20 years. And uh, let's see, um, I did not grow up with horses. Um, I grew up in St. Petersburg, Florida. I was one of those kids that um, was came out of the womb loving horses, although there's no rational explanation for why, because no one else in my in my family is a horse person and uh, kind of grew up um, learning sort of the traditional ways with horses that my only access was through a Girl Scout summer camp where I learned to ride every summer. That was really my only access to horses growing up. And then um, attended college because uh, picked my college because it had an equestrian program. So the early part of my life was really kind of more traditional type riding and training. And then um, I didn't own my own horse myself until I was 30 years old and moved uh, to this farm shortly after that. So I've been here, like I said, 20 years uh, now. I don't know. Is that, what else did you want to know, Linda? Well, oh, for some reason, I can't hear you, Linda. Oh, helps if I unmute. There, there uh, anyway, um, tell us about the horses you have there. And what okay. else do you have on the farm? I know you have yeah. something else too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So obviously you see one of my horses behind me. This is Marcus. Um, currently I have four horses here on my farm. Uh, I had a herd of five for a while until um, unfortunately in January, I lost my herd elder who um, he had been with me for almost 20 years. Marcus is a, uh, a thoroughbred warm blood cross. He's huge. He's 18 hands. Obviously, as you see, a beautiful gray. He's been with me for about three years, and he was a former show jumper, a, hunt, a hunter jumper, and had to be retired early at about age 15 uh, due to a variety of health issues. Um, and he's an interesting story we may get into. Having been a show horse, he never lived. He lived pretty much in stalls or in isolated paddocks, as a lot of show horses do. So he had never lived with a herd, and his integration was a challenging one. Um, a lot of uh, you know, interesting lessons there about uh, early learning and socialization. And even with humans, sometimes we feel like we, 
we don't have that early on. And so the learning curve is steep when we, when we have to uh, learn that later. So that's Marcus. And then I have um, my other three will probably show up at some point. They're all in the yard here, but they're behind the house right now. Um, I have uh, three other horses. Two are a mother daughter pair, quarter horses named Puck and Tempo. And Tempo is the only horse I have ever um, bred and raised. I'm not really a big proponent of breeding, but at that time in my life, uh, about 12, 13 years ago, I had wanted to raise a baby from birth. So uh, there's their mother daughter pair. And then I have another little gelding named Rayleigh Cario. We call him Rayleigh. And he's a little Pasifino who is the newest member of my herd. He's been here uh, just over a year and a half, I guess. And um, then, yes, I have a pig named Bartholomew the pig. He's a potbelly mixed pig <laughs> who just showed up here about three years ago, not long after Marcus got here and just uh, wouldn't leave and decided he wanted to join the herd and made friends with all the horses. So he's he's part of the crew here. Excellent. And there's a, your article this time in our magazine has a, his story in it and yeah. how he's uh, how you've learned from that story too of him showing up and integrating with the horses so excellent absolutely so part of our vision uh, uh, human uh, humanity needs horses but equine leadership is that horses live as close to nature as possible mm -hmm. um so you were telling me the other day you don't have stalls or stable uh, on your land there how do you live them as close to nature as possible but also what are the challenges i know we all have challenges we the horses are uh, in our care or in our stewardship and there are challenges to that so what are how do you do it and what are some of the challenges yeah so um, first of all yeah they, I absolutely believe in trying to, to do that to, to the extent possible obviously on a small acreage farm like this that can be challenging but one of the ways I do it is I do not have um, a barn or stalls I do have run-in shelters um, here we don't really deal with a lot of horrible winter weather so the worst is actually the heat and humidity in the summer so a chance for them to be able to, you know, get, I also have a lot of trees on my property, big trees, um, but so they can, they can have shade. Um, but in terms of living as naturally as possible, they are um, able to have as much movement. So I'm going to move so you can see him too. Um, as much movement as possible. And then um, I have, in terms of management of this property being small, I have three areas that are kind of turnout for grazing two pastures, uh, each about an acre. And then this is what I call my yard that they're in right now around the house, which is also another area for them for grazing. And there's also a variety of shrubs and plants in the yard. So they get to do a little bit of browsing and foraging, which is another really important aspect of natural horse behavior. They don't just eat grass. Um, they also do a lot of foraging. And I have oak trees that drop acorns. So they, they love to hunt for the acorns, uh, which, a lot of horse people, you know, worry about, but as long as it's the the uh, brown and dried acorns that naturally fall off, they're actually very safe. Um, the pig also loves to hunt for acorns, so that's one way that they keep themselves busy and get to exhibit natural behavior. Um, the other big one, um, because of the small acreage, it's not enough uh, grass and foraging to sustain all of their nu nutritional requirements. So I keep hay out in, I do it in hay, slow hay nets, um, but they always have hay available if they would like to supplement their diet with the hay and so that they can keep, um, you know, horses are designed biologically to be trickle feeders and to graze and eat a lot of forage over the course of a 24 hour period. Usually they eat for about 18 hours of that. So I like to be able to keep their digestive systems working as naturally as possible. And then the other big factor for me with my horses is giving them as much uh, choice as possible and different micro environments to explore, even on a small property. And um, I often open up the whole property so that they can kind of choose where they want to go and wander from one area to another and, you know, visit different micro environments during the day. All of this um, just creates a, a naturally stimulating environment for them that's also um, conducive to relaxed um, behavior in the horses and less stress. Excellent. Excellent. So what are some of the challenges that you have there? You well, the, chal the, the challenges, <laughs> um, well, one is keeping grass growing on a small property. Uh, I do have, um, I forgot to mention the other two areas I have, are, I call them like loafing areas. Uh, they're basically dirt paddocks, smaller paddocks, um, still much larger than a, way larger than a stall, but um, they typically spend the nights in the loafing areas. Um, so they're not turned out 24 hours a day. Otherwise my whole property would be nothing but mud. 
uh, this mud back here, I was telling Linda earlier is because uh, my pig was doing some loafing after <laughs> the recent rains. Um, but that's the thing, animals are tough on property. So one of my challenges is balancing their need to have freedom of movement and, and grazing and foraging with um, you know resting the property enough that I can keep grass growing. So I, I have to um, manage and move the herd around a, a couple times every day in order to be able to do that. So that's one of the big challenges here. All right. Okay. Um, so let's talk, let's get on to that horse human relationship. And mm -hmm. um, perhaps let's talk a bit about what you, what you do there with that, you know, how do you um, enunciate that, that voice of the horse? How do you, yeah. you know, what's the work that you do with the, hor the humans and the horses? Yeah, okay. So to get into that, I think I want to talk a little bit about how I got into this work. Um, so uh, again, I was sort of more a traditional horsemanship uh, training type person for a lot of my life. And um, there were two things that led me into kind of doing this work with, with humans and, and horses. And the first was when I was a kid, I talked about going to those summer camps. And on the way to the summer camp, when my mom would drive me, we used to pass, this was in Florida, we would pass a ranch that was run by the sheriff's office. And um, I don't really remember what it was called. I just remember there was a sign out front that said um, uh, troubled youth's boys ranch. And it was um, troubled youth and I think rescued horses. And at the time I really you know, didn't have any concept of what that was exactly, but it was really intriguing to me. And I remember asking my mom about it and she said, Oh, you know, that's for, that's for juvenile delinquents. Cause I wanted to go there. And, um, uh, interesting label at that time but um you know what was interesting is I was I want I wish that I was a boy and that I had gotten in trouble so I could go you know be part of this community that I just somehow sensed was about the relationship between horses and humans and that there was this idea that uh, healing uh, could occur together so that seed was planted really early and then my experiences after that with horses were really much more just what most people are able to be exposed to uh, through the traditional horse industry of learning to ride and train and groom and those sorts of things um, went on for a long, long time. Uh, and then when I had my first horse at age 30, I was married already at that time and um, had some unhealthy relationship patterns in my own life. And that, that marriage, uh, that relationship was actually quite unhealthy for both of us, honestly. And uh, it was the journey I took over a number of years with my horse Tempo, the one I bred and raised, who uh, I had kind of her whole life planned out for her before she was born. I had a lot of ambitious goals with her. And then from the day she was born, nothing worked out the way that it was supposed, well, the way that I had planned for it to be, it's all worked out the way it was supposed to. But that uh, she turned out to be a horse that um, just didn't, uh, I couldn't, uh, train her into the kind of animal I wanted her to be. She's very strong-willed and was like going to be the individual that she is. And that was a beautiful thing. And she actually taught me how to step into my own self-worth and my own value and to never compromise who I am. Um, it was a, a journey over an, almost a decade together that brought me around into a different way of being with horses. And the experience that she and I had was one of healing together. She changed me, um, but she also changed during that. And it was really learning that um, healing is, is a communal process many times and um, that when it's done correctly, it heals everybody involved. And so that's kind of the background through which I come into this. And then after my divorce, it took me a few more years to get the courage to leave a career that had been very successful, but that was not really um, in alignment with my soul. I let just like, uh, and I, I always knew, Marcus is right here with us. Um, I always knew that uh, my destiny was, was to do work with horses and, and people. I just didn't know how. But so anyway, that's a long way of saying that um, I really, I didn't have training in needs to learning. I'm not a counselor or a therapist, and I don't even consider what I do here as counseling or therapy. It's just a chance for people to come and learn about horses. And so um, one of the first things I say when people come is that the horses here don't have any job except to be their authentic selves, right? And that, <laughs> that we learn from them. 
and that, that, that nobody who comes here has any job except to honor uh, who the horses are and to honor who they are. And so that's the one way that healing starts from the beginning is just come here. There's no expectations. There's no agenda. We're just going to relax into um, learning about each other and uh, honoring who we are and how we feel in the moment. And then things evolve from there. So typically we'd spend a fair amount of time doing herd observation in the beginning. And I introduce people to the horses and we just watch and um, things bubble up. So people will ask questions. Um, I love talking about horse behavior, not just living with my herd for 20 years, but I'm kind of obsessed with uh, natural horse behavior and learning about wild horses. So um, questions bubble up. I don't try to direct it. I kind of see what, um, what bubbles up for whoever's here and the conversations are co-created from there. And then at some point we either decide or don't that um, we all feel comfortable to go on into the pasture and what I call joining the herd. So again, there's not really an agenda. There aren't specific activities that we do. Um, we just get into the space with the horses and the presence and we feel what it feels like to be part of the herd. And again, it's amazing. Things will just bubble up naturally um, that we, we talk about or don't talk about. And um, it's just every session is different and unique and beautifully powerful. Excellent. So is there a specific uh, demographic you work with? You talked about seeing the, the place for troubled youth. Do you work with youth, the women? Is there a specific or do you have specializations? Um, not so much, except that I typically work with adults. So I, I do I, I do make exceptions occasionally and, and work with children. But um, I really love working with adults. And I tend to, I think just because of the messaging I put out and the marketing I do and the kinds of things that I publish, a majority of my, my um, people are women, but not all. I, I definitely have a core group of, of men who come and, and enjoy the horses and are part of my programs. So I would say the demographic really is just adults. And it's really anyone who, they sort of come, I think, with an already a curiosity about horses. They're yeah. interested in learning about horses. And they're also interested in um, personal growth and personal awareness. That that's that's really the only criteria. Yeah. And what programs, due to the nature of the world we're in now, what kind of programs are you holding now, and how are you, how are you hosting them? Yeah. So obviously things are different. Um, what's interesting is after doing the hands-on work with the horses and people for a number of years, I kind of already started to evolve into um, doing some personal coaching. So what we discovered is that um, the sessions with the horses are so powerful and sometimes the things that come up take weeks, months even to process uh, completely. And it's not that someone needs to come back the next week and necessarily have more time with the horses. Those learnings um, carry with them for a long time. And sometimes the best thing we can do is continue to process them over the phone or through Zoom or virtually. And so I sort of naturally evolved into doing some you could call it coaching. I, I call it peer mentoring uh, kind of work. So that was already being done remotely. And I had ar also built a program that was designed to be a six month online program that was a combination of online. And then once a month, people would come here and do a session with the horses. But it was based in the six sort of topics or themes that seem to come up over and over and over again in all the sessions. Things like, like kind of who am I and what's my purpose? Um, Boundaries is definitely a huge one, you know, uh, trust, uh, communication, how to be vulnerable, um, self-care. Some of these topics that just come up over and over again, I've kind of, there's an online curriculum that um, addresses those. That's not actually one-on-one -on -one work with the horses, but I weave a lot of horse wisdom into it. And uh, so I have some people now who do that and combine it with uh, sessions here. And then I have some who just do the online portion from all over the world. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Excellent. So um, let's talk about space and how do you hold space for the horses and for humans or how do you hold space for horses and humans to connect or that relationship? And I know when we were talking the other day, you added something onto that, that horse human, you added another aspect to that. So can we talk about a little bit about how do you hold space for each and how do you create that space for each to, to thrive and evolve? Yeah, so um, 
I think actually start out with physical space. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we, we notice, well, first of all, I, I tell everyone that um, self-care is the golden rule here and the horses are, they're experts at self-care. As long as they are free to make their own choices, they will always do, um, you know, they'll take care of themselves naturally. So I don't worry about them because they're not being forced into anything. And I tell the people who come that their job really is only to just be in tune with how they feel and to vocalize that and to never feel like they need to do anything they're uncomfortable with. So that creates a, a safe space um, automatically where there's not a lot of pressure. But then as we are observing the horses, we notice that um, horses don't actually touch each other very often, right? Um, and because we're honoring the horses for their authentic selves, kind of one of my, I don't really have rule, a lot of rules, but one of them is that, you know, we're probably not going to initiate any touch with the horses unless they initiate it first. So that creates some automatic space. And um, then it kind of begs the question of, because uh, everyone who comes out, of course, wants to connect with the horses, right? And how do we connect without touching, without the physical touch? Because that's, as humans, especially with animals, that's what, what we want to do. So observing the horses, we notice the way that they kind of come in and out of nearing each other's personal space, and they talk about personal space. And um, then we, as we join the herd, kind of engage in some of those same conversations. And we, we can recognize that with, even without language, we can one, we can understand body language, but it's really more about centering ourselves and feeling the energy of yes and no, right? You kind of know. I, people, I'm always amazed when people, you know, will say, yeah, I don't think I want to get any closer than this because I just, I just feel like this is where the horse is comfortable and I'm comfortable. Um, so I don't know if that, that's, I'm kind of talking more about physical space. No, that's but, fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You, so you spoke the other day though about uh, when we were talking about like the horses and humans, but then you added on the horses again. Oh, I, yes. Okay. So horses, Sorry, let's talk about that. Horses, healing, human, heal, healing, horses, healings, humans, healing horses, right? Yeah. That idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. okay. That's, that sort of cycle of, um, yeah. So the best way I know how to talk about this is that none of us, horses or human kind of get through our journey in the domestic world without some kind of, um, trauma i hate to use that word because it seems so severe but we um you know we have challenges we get hurt we have you know, just physical and emotional wounds going through life it's um in the domestic world there's so many pressures on us horses and humans to um comply with and kind of become who others think we should be or ought to be and so when we give ourselves this space to just say you be you and I'm going to be me and actually um, encourage ourselves to get in touch with how we feel versus how we think others are, are interpreting us or how they're going to respond to us. We're just kind of tuning into authentically who am I and how do I feel? Um, there's that mutual healing. So the horses in the sessions, it usually starts out that the horses do something uh, or there's a revelation that comes that's very healing to the humans. And then as we start interacting with the horses and we're honoring them and we're honoring ourselves, most of my horses have some kind of trauma in their background. Some have more than others where their, um, their experiences with humans or in the human world was um, very challenging for them. And they carry baggage from that just like we do. And to watch as they shed those layers of either um, insecurity or fear or stress or anxiety and their true self comes out and they start interacting out of curiosity and trust and playfulness versus, um, you know, I'm supposed to stand here while someone gets pet, pets me or whatever, that, whatever it is that they've maybe been taught in the past, just like we're taught to behave certain ways, they're taught to behave certain ways. And so the healing goes back to the horse and the horse is now every interaction that my horses have with a human that doesn't perpetuate those patterns of the past. I can see how healing it is for them in those moments. Yeah. And, then, and then when the human realizes that they've helped the horse heal, I can't tell you like the amount of healing that does to the humans because they came thinking they're just going to learn about horses or maybe get some healing themselves. They never occurred to them that they were going to be able to help the horses, especially people who've never been around horses and think they don't know what to do. 
that is sometimes the most healing aspect of it. So that's that cycle of, of yeah. horses, healing humans, healing horses. No, that's beautiful. That's uh, or, the other, or the other way around. <laughs> absolutely. And we don't, we don't often think of it that way. So that's a, uh, that's a really nice, uh, and a new way, a new perspective to to take back. Uh, so let's uh, let's move into your story. I know your story as of late um, is interesting, and I think it sheds a lot of light on uh, what we're going through right now and how it how the horses mimic it in their lives and their history. So over to you on that one, and or in any other stories you wish to share of of um, clients or anything like that. But I think your story is. We need to hear that. <laughs> so you talking you talking about recently when I've been yep. sick? Yep. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I've actually been in kind of self isolation a little longer than most everyone else has because early on, at least here in the U.S. So early in March, um, I had been working at a festival where I was um, working a kiosk booth. This was just to help out a local festival, and I'd been interacting with lots of people and scanning tickets on phones and putting wristbands on. So people from all over the world. I had been interacting with hundreds sometimes thousands of people an evening. And I was aware of the COVID-19 um, and, you know, kind of that it was supposed to be heading to the U.S. and all of that. And so I, I noticed that, and the people that I worked with in the kiosk had, um, had some underlying health conditions, some were older. So I was really conscious of being enclosed in this space with them if, um, if I was feeling sick. And I started to, you know, feel a little sick had a little fever. So I called in and I you know, said I wasn't going to come in for the last week of the festival just to be safe. And um, I, it, at that time, testing wasn't really uh, widely available here. And they were still having the criteria of, um, you know, only if you've traveled overseas to certain places, could you qualify for testing? So I never was able to get tested. And so still don't have a, a confirmed answer as to whether I had uh, COVID-19. But um, definitely my doctor and I are both pretty convinced that that is what I had, but I, I've been, I've, I've now been feeling like hundred percent again for about a week, but I was, I was sick for uh, at least four weeks off and on, not, not bedridden and not sick enough to be in the hospital, but definitely, um, not, not my normal self. Here come some, some more joining us again. Here they come. Um, and so in here, I love being here alone. I don't mind being an introvert. So that part was not hard for me, but it was, there was a difference between um, voluntarily choosing to be here and actually feeling like I couldn't go and couldn't have anyone here. So mentally that was challenging for me. And here they are. I love this. They're like, we were here with you. And they were here with me every day. It was so comforting to, um, even when I was a little bit afraid and I was, it was clear that my body really didn't know how to handle that virus, that's how I knew it was something different. I, it was very clear my body wasn't sure what to do. And some days were better than others. But I would come outside and spend time here with the horses and they're just so present. And they were like, it's just us, it's just you, everything's still fine, the world is, the world is well. And it was super comforting for me. Um, the other thing that I really took away from that was the, the recognition that Ooh, horses kind of live in that state all the time in the domestic world. Um, even though I try to have the most, you know, lovely life that I can give them here, they are still confined within the fencing of my property. And although it can be easy to feel sad about that, what's really amazing is how much peace the horses make with it. And that we can feel independent and full and whole and liberated even within with, within a constraint or a confinement, um, as long as we're true, we're able to be who we are and we, we do have some choices, um, you know, about where we go, what we eat. We have, we have control over our, our lives and our daily choices, even within that confinement. And being with them and realizing how peaceful they feel. And the other piece was that they, you know, they're part of a community and they were a community for me. And even when I was in the house and they were outside, I still felt connected energetically with them. So there was also the lesson of we don't necessarily have to be in physical proximity with someone to feel their presence and know that they're, they're with us and our community is with us. So those are some of the lessons, I guess, um, of that time. But certainly um, the horses helped me through that period a lot. For sure. And I love your statement earlier about how do we connect without touching? Mm. And I think that's really um, 
prevalent these days? Like, how do we connect with people and each other even without touching? Yeah. So, so I, uh, I don't know if we have time. I have another little story about yeah, a client, a client related to that. So it wasn't long before all of this isolation uh, kicked in that I had an, uh, a seasoned client. He was in his uh, probably 70s, maybe close to 80. I'm not really sure uh, who came out and his daughter actually bought the session for him for his birthday. He wasn't really a horse person, but he'd been around horses when he was young and he was just feeling like he really wanted to have a connection with them again. He was a lovely gentleman who um, was kind of very gregarious and um, definitely talking about touch. He loved to hug. He would put his arm around you, touch your shoulder when he talked to you. And it was all very, uh, very friendly and not, not intimidating at all. But he, he, he used touch a lot. That was sort of his love language, I guess. And um, it, in Marcus, the horse back there, since he grew up with people and spent most of his life with people, he tends to be, um, he, he, he likes touch also. And he usually initiates and comes over to meet new people. So they had an immediate connection and the gentleman that felt really good to him. But it was funny how he immediately honed in on the horses that had not come over and especially Tempo, who's the one, I don't like to like label them, but she's typically the one that is least, uh, she's most protective of her physical body and, and really doesn't, um, she wants to be in control of touch if it happens, let's put it that way. She prefers that. And he immediately honed in on her and was kind of like, I, I want to connect with that one, which is so funny, like, all right. And so um, I said, all right, let's, let's go in and, and see. And, um, you know, again, I, I teach them to honor what the horses are saying. And Tempo just kept repeatedly telling him, really not closer than six, five or six feet. That's about where I, where I want you to be. And so he was feeling really frustrated with that and kind of rejected, which is kind of our human um, response to when the horses don't want to initiate or interact with us physically. Yeah. And uh, I kind of said, well, let's, after I let him, I let him get a little frustrated. Um, he was honoring her, but he just, it was, he just felt sad, I guess, that he couldn't connect. And I think he felt sad for her. And I said, well, what's interesting is this whole time we've been having this conversation with her, she's saying no to you coming closer than, you know, five or six feet, but she's staying right here. She had the whole property. She could have gone anywhere. Yeah. She's not, le she's not leaving you. And he's like, hmm. and I said, so I think she wants to connect with you. Just maybe we can think about doing it on, on her terms if you want to connect with her. And he said, well, I, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, let's think about what we've watched the horses do. And one of the things that horses do is they, they'll synchronize. So they line up their bodies parallel to each other. Sometimes synchrony is a sign that they are connected emotionally when they're out grazing. So I suggested that he keep that distance that she had designated five or six feet and he stand parallel to her um, shoulder and face the same direction she was and line his legs up with her front legs. And I said, just, you know, get present with her. And if she takes a step, you take a step. If she leans her body, you lean her body. Like get really, really present with her and connect emotionally and then just mirror her with your body. And so he started doing that. And I, we, I walked away. The daughter was here too. And I mean, I, we walked away and we're talking for like 30 minutes and he's still at it, right? And, I, and they are just into it so big. And so finally, I kind of walked back up and I was like, so how's this going? And he's like, oh my gosh, this is the most amazing thing I've ever done. She totally gets it. We're playing a game. Sometimes she's stepping first and I'm following. And sometimes I'm stepping first and she's following. And he was just blown away at the level that they connected without touching each other. And here's what's really interesting. Later, when um, I debriefed with him in a more uh, formal way, he said, um, this has changed my perspective forever. Wow. He said, he said, I used to... Um, get frustrated especially he said especially with women which i understand because women can be funny about our personal not funny we're you know we're truthful about our, our personal space and i guess there's been a couple times recently when someone had said to him i'm just not comfortable with you touching me like that and he was quite offended and he said to be honest i was irritated with them um but that comes from a place of he was feeling rejected right not um just emotionally he wanted to connect and, and they weren't comfortable with that but he said Tempo has completely changed my perspective on that. He said, I now understand how those women were feeling and I will, I will never get frust frustrated with that again. And he said, I will, I will think very differently about my own, um, you know, approach to connecting with people. So, I mean, wow, right? Wow. That's really powerful. And how old was he? Yeah. He was 
late 70s? Uh, like I said, yeah, late 70s for sure. So to change a perspective and been on earth for that long. Yes. That's huge. And, Ooh, yeah. yeah. Wow. And that's, that, that hits on something that, that I think is the power of the healing with horses and humans is that something like that, that like you said, he'd been getting feedback on that probably his whole life yeah. and hadn't, hadn't been able to switch over to that place of empathy out of his own feelings of hurt to feelings of empathy for the other person with all those experiences. And for me, when I was, I had gone through years of marriage therapy and I had not been able to understand what tempo, same horse, tempo helped me understand, which was, um, there was an incident I had with her that really showed me. So in my marriage, um, I allowed myself to be controlled and manipulated, right? Um, that was his way of, of interacting. And I allowed that, which with, I, but I had a lot of resentment for him feel, because I felt controlled and manipulated. And it was Tempo who showed me that in my relationship with her, it was mirroring the relationship I had with my ex-husband, except he was the one manipulating and controlling me. And I was the one manipulating and controlling her. Yeah. And for me to realize that, wow, I'm doing the same thing. Um, uh, that was huge. And, and she helped me see things that years of marriage therapy, I, I hadn't been able to really embody those things in the same way. So I don't know what it is. It seems like magic sometimes with horses, but yes, we can, we can experience things that change our perspective in ways that nothing else has. Absolutely. And you talk in your article about codependency yeah. and that how the horses help us come out of that codependency or see it at least. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. So um, my work with the horses has had me doing a lot more research. I knew that I had codependency issues, but I really didn't understand that the, the basic definition of codependency is anytime we turn our responsibility for our own happening over to someone or something outside of ourselves. So if other people's perceptions or um, of us are kind of what we define our happiness, then we've turned our happiness over. If we're turning to alcohol or anything else, you know, that to make us happy, then we're codependent. So codependency is basically the addiction to looking elsewhere. And it's the addiction that all other addictions are based in. But the way that horses help us with that is um, horses understand that to have healthy community you have to have healthy independent individuals within that community so they value their community and their herds but it's only healthy because each horse takes care of him or herself they don't need anything from the other horses to be centered and balanced in themselves and if in the herd so when marcus came to my herd and he didn't know how to take care of himself in a herd he had no idea how to take care of himself the other horses, um, he got some tough love at the beginning because he didn't know how to be healthily independent. And so he was disrupting the balance and sanctity of the herd. So they had to help him. They had to mentor him into learning how to take better care of himself so that he could be a member of the herd that was a productive member of the herd and not um, a liability in a sense to the herd. And horses sense this in us too. If any sense, any energy of neediness, or I need something from you, you being the horse, they will read that in a skinny minute and either they're out of there or they are gonna do something that says, you know, readjust yourself, readjust your thinking here. Um, I wanna be with you when you're really okay with you and you're letting me really be okay with me. Then we can be together in a place that is just enjoyment enjoyment of each other and not needing anything from each other so i guess that's excellent. how i would explain it excellent no beautifully said so then let's let's move to the bigger picture so we've okay. talked about you and your horses but uh this whole humanity needs the horses sort of stemmed from the situation the world is in right now and what the horses can teach us and and how it ties into equine leadership's belief that uh, the horses show us a model of um our, our peaceful and positive living and your horses certainly show it today they're just peaceful and they're they're out there in the moment and being present so uh, if we look at the bigger picture um you know how do you see horses and the model they have changing humanity hmm. bigger big big question 
<laughs> yeah, huge question. Um, I think I would take this back to um, the, psych the cyclical nature of, of healing. And um, for me, although I have a deep connection with horses and I think horses themselves have this amazing healing capacity and that they want to heal and they want to help us heal. But perhaps in the bigger picture, uh, horses are my conduit to the larger natural world and the rhythms of the natural world. And they remind me that we are part of the natural world. We are not, um, we're all one. We're not disconnected from it. Although we live that way often. Um, and the model that horses have, it's, it's very accessible to us because we as humans live with horses. And I think that's really where the humanity meets the horses comes in is there's probably equally great models in other animal communities. Uh, we just don't have access to them the way that we do with horses. And there's always been this crazy connection between humans and horses throughout history. So I, I do tend to believe that um, we're here to help each other in wh whatever ways. And for a long time, horses, we used, we needed them, humans needed them to help us with progress, you know, transportation and work and those sorts of things. And we don't so much need that anymore. So I think it's, we're all kind of evolving into this next level of what are horses um, here to help us with next, right? And I think it's bringing us back to that connection with nature and the natural world and our our primal instincts. I don't know if you could hear that. They're, they're saying, yes, yes. You get <laughs> like, it. They, you get it, right? Like, um, I think they've been waiting for us to get to this place where we can like let go of our obsession of how we need to use horses and really connect more with um, what can we learn from them and their model. Oh, yeah. use, for, use versus learn. Yeah. Or, yeah. or what can we, yeah, instead of using the, what we can learn. I like that. I really like that. Um, yeah. You talked about, and I think this ties in here, you talked earlier about six topics or six theme, like basic themes. Yeah. What, you know, can you, re, yeah, you rhymed off a few of them there, but what do you see as those ones? You, I know you did, a, I tried to write down a few, but. <laughs> yeah. So let me, see was one. I, let me see if I can remember. So um, the first one is kind of who am I and um, what is my what are my values? You know, what is, what is the soul of me about? Mm -hmm. So getting reconnected with that. And I know that's huge. That's something that unfortunately we don't really get taught. Yeah. Maybe, if, maybe if you do counseling, but it's not really something we, we teach in school. It's often not even something that uh, we yeah. learn in our, in our family. So who am I? What am I about? The second one is about boundaries. So that's about how do I stay true to myself in the world and in relationship? Um, that's what the boundaries mm -hmm. uh, is often about. Then we have, um, oh, fears, right? What fears yep. are holding, well, fears are holding me back. Yep. And then uh, self-care. Yep. And then um, my, uh, uh, trying to remember what that, one, what that one is actually called right now, but it's about um, being present and allowing, right? Instead of trying to force agendas, but just working with, working with what's happening, working with what's, what occurs, being present in the moment. Yeah. And then the final one is like my, my tribe, my vibe attracts my tribe. So yeah. the healthier, yeah. the healthier we get and the more that we live authentically, we're going to attract that kind of energy and those kind of people into our lives. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. We're going to print these out or I'm going to type these out and put them in a post later so that we all can share those. So um, I have one final question to you and you to share with everybody is okay. if you, um, through the horses or with the horses through you, um, what's a call to action for us humans? What do you see as one call to action? What do we need to do right now? So the call to action that comes to my mind right now is just that together we heal, right? So that's, that's, it's not just humans and horses, it's, it's humans and humans, it's horses and horses, it's horses and humans. It is all of us with the natural world. I really think at this particular time um, in history and what's happening right now is none of us really want, we want to get back to, um, back to life, right? But I don't think that we should or do really want to get back to the way things were. I think we can do better. And being, there's so many models and so much truth and so much healing that comes from the natural world that that's my call to action is that we stop looking to 
just ourselves and our kind of thinking brains about what's next and where should we go and get more back to our hearts and looking at uh, the natural world and natural cycles to say, what can we learn from those and incorporate back into our lives? Um, Excellent. Natural cycles. Perfect. A great one great one and i'm sure by the time we're done all this we're going to have a great great list of calls to action because oh, i can't all, wait they're all so valuable um yeah. any final words we have come to the end of our questions any final words or any words you sense from the horses or from the pig <laughs> ah well i'm glad you brought the pig up because he was just coming into my mind i don't see him i was telling linda before we started that he was he was out a lot uh rummaging around earlier and this time of day he typically sleeps he's a pig he loves to you know life is just abundance so he he eats and he sleeps um but this is something that he, so he was um I, I also look a lot into animal, animal symbolism when things happen so certain birds that show up during sessions or when the pig shows up or whatever so when this pig showed up in my life i was like what is this about right and especially he wouldn't leave and like i said that was about three and a half years ago so i was just getting started i was making that huge leap of faith from leaving my other career of um, higher education uh, fundraising and nonprofit management to try to make a go at this with my own business. And I had a lot of, um, a lot of fears around money, a lot of lack of confidence, um, just lots of like that. It was, it was a stressful time, although it was exciting. And then this pig showed up. And so I went up to my book and I, and especially when he wouldn't leave, I said, what is, what is the symbolism of pigs? And a couple things. The first one is just abundance, right? And it's so true. Whenever I see him, I just can't be stressed out about things. Like there's grass is everywhere, air is everywhere, life is everywhere. You know, I have companions. I have I have people I love in my life. Like that's all you need to be to be happy. So this this abundance of of what's important was was huge. And then the other was um, pigs symbolize and represent forward progress. And the reason they do is because when they root with their noses, they can only root going forward, right? And so it was about going forward and not going backwards. And when we are feeling unconfident or insecure, and boy, is that relevant for right now, don't go backwards. Like, don't go back to where you've been and the way things were, um, even if that's your comfort zone. Just keep moving forward keep finding a new way and so whenever I see Bart you know rummaging when he's doing a hole like that in my yard <laughs> it's, do you want you want to get frustrated and then I remember this symbolism of he can only do that going forward and um that's just I think that's a beautiful message and I yeah. think that that's what Bart would like to share with everyone <laughs> there we go and like I said there's pictures in your article and um yeah in your article in our magazine so go there to find his story um I just want to say thank you for thank being you. here today. This is, uh, there's so much, I have literally written a full page on everything that you said. There's so much wisdom and so many takeaways in what you have. Mm -hmm. And I will certainly share them and we'll share this, um, this interview. Um, you wrote something, I'd like to finish on something that you wrote in your article and you said that our farm is an unusual place, but mm -hmm. it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think that is a really, that's a really powerful thing to me that places like your that, that you have there are unusual, but they shouldn't be. And I think that for us is, is something like, let's make more of them. Let's have more yeah. places like this that people can come to. That's so, beautiful. And Linda, yeah. I just want to, I want to thank you because you actually, through this work, through the magazine, uh, through these interviews, you are you are actually helping to make that happen. I think just spreading awareness about all the ways that people, I love, I love Debbie's interview and I can't wait to see the others to learn from everyone else about what they're doing. And the more that we see these models, um, you know, gives people courage to, to um, step into it themselves. So thank you. I was muted there. Um, you know, <laughs> thank you very much. So thanks for coming today. Thank you everybody for watching. We will thank certainly you. post this later and um, have a wonderful, wonderful Tuesday. And we'll see you thanks. next week. Thanks everybody. Bye Kim. Awesome. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you.